first tell us your story, like how did you get into computer development? I know you were in a uh, computer group <clears throat> uh, when you were a kid, and how did that kind of lead to you getting into DMA Designs? Hello, everybody. Um, so, how did I start? Uh, so, about when I was 13, so 1983, uh, ZX81 came out, um, and the mic's just gone off. How is it? Hold oh, it a bit closer. A bit closer, okay. Uh, so, ZX81 came out, and uh, so that was the first computer really you could get at home, and I got really excited. I didn't get one, my friend got one. Um, we used to go down and play games, and then we'd try a little basic programming, which was great fun. And then he sold up to get a Spectrum, and I was able to get his ZX81. And from then, it was just utterly hooked on coding. Uh, the games were all very good, but just making this machine do something was just amazing. It's like you could tell it, do this, and it would do it. It was, it was cool. Um, and basic was all very good, but it was pretty slow, particularly in ZX81. Um, there was magazines that came out back then, a lot of you will remember them, where you get all the basic listings and stuff in them. Um, and that was, that was good fun. But um, the one thing that really changed for me was I managed to get a magazine with an assembly listing in it. And at the back of the ZX81 manual, they had all these opcodes listed that was just like black magic. Who knew what they did? Um, but this magazine, with its listing, you could suddenly see well, that's what it means. Oh, like, look, there's a loop and there's a branch and there's a call. Oh, cool. So I was able to suddenly start coding in Assembler. And from then on, it was just, oh, huge amounts of fun. Um, I then got a Spectrum. As my, my mum's work decided they wanted a database and asked me if I could write one. I was thinking I was about 15 at the time. I was like, that's no problem at all. So I wrote them a database. I got a really nice Spectrum set up. Um, it was a 48K Spectrum, but with a really nice that low profile keyboard mm. that was really nice because they were all typists and needed a proper keyboard um, and a BBC disk drive. So it was a really cool setup. So I had that for about a year, uh, did them their database and did some Spectrum coding as well. Um, and then from then on, I got my Commodore Plus 4 for Christmas and that got me into 6502 instead of Z80, which is much nicer. Um, and I will fight anybody on that. <laughs> and that really got me into to using hardware because the Spectrum's obviously uh, software. You know, you get a screen and a CPU, you go at it. That's pretty much what Spectrum is. The Plus 4 had character maps in it and smooth scrolling and stuff like that um, and raster interrupts and things. So I got to play with it a little bit. Um, and then I managed to write a game on that using just the built-in monitor, which isn't an assembler. You just poke straight into memory with stuff. And I did a full game on that. I have no idea how I managed to do that. Looking back at it now, it was just determination. What, what game was that? As well? uh, it was just a really bad breakout game. Okay. So <laughs> I actually started a, a, a different breakout game uh, using proper software sprites that was all nicely smooth and stuff. But because it was in the monitor, not an assembler, I had a notepad with where all the addresses of things were. Um, so that it could go in and change. If you want to insert a line, you'd have to block copy memory about and patch up all the addresses. And this notepad told me where everything was. And I was down at Steve Hammond's one night and I forgot my notepad and just went, ah, saw it, we'll just start again. So I started doing a different one that was just character based. Um, so it actually got accepted to be sold by Cascade Games, but they wanted the ball to be smoother and stuff and I couldn't be bothered with that. So I just ignored that. Um, and then I got a uh, Commodore 64 from my friend who was selling up his machine. Um, and from then on, I just, oh, sprites, it was great. Um, and I got really into all that kind of coding. Um, when I had my plus four, that's when I started going to this computer club. Um, a friend at school had told me, you should really go there, it's, you know, it's your kind of thing. So, okay, so you had to take along your computer and your TV. So your old CRT TV, um, you had to cart along. Fortunately, I had a portable which was unheard of back in the mid 80s, but we managed to get a black and white portable. So I had a big hold all bag that I usually use for my cricket stuff. There's my computer and this TV in it that carted on a two different bus journeys to get to this place. Um, and I set up and I met Steve Hammond, uh, Russell Kate and Dave Jones at this computer club. Um, I think it was the first time I was there and David brought his Amiga 
Uh, so he's Omega uh, 1000 that he just bought with his redundancy. So he was set up at the back. Um, I was speaking to Steve because 6502, Commodore 64, my plus four. And it, you just got drawn. The, the crowd was around Dave's machine, just seeing this amazing thing. I'm sitting there with these horrible black and white graphics because I only had a black and white TV. And Dave's got like Defender of the Crown running. It was just amazing. <laughs> Total jealousy. So, um, but we all got talking together because we were all really into making things. The rest of the club, and there was quite a few, maybe 20 or 30 folk there, they were all just there to copy games. Basically, it was a copying fest. Um, and we didn't really want to, we were just like, how did you make this work? How did you do that? It was really just, you know, the challenge of getting these machines to do things. Um, so Russell was on a spectrum. He, he, he and Dave were supposed to be doing the game called Moonshadow um, on the spectrum. It finally came out as Zone Trooper. Um, but Dave got really bored of it. And his Amiga was far too shiny to go back to Spectrum stuff. So he just let Russell finish. Um, so Russell took ages to finish this game. Uh, but they were doing a commercial game. You know, you go to this club and somebody there writing an actual game. So it was quite cool. Um, and we would all just talk about different things and now the game would break off and a couple of us would try doing a game on our respective platforms. Uh, Russell and I went to start doing a, a gauntlet style game uh, split with spatter, spatter light? Splat. Right. Remember Splat on the Spectrum where the, the wee cursor moves about, and the, the scroll moves on its own and you have to keep up. Well we thought what if you did a gauntlet game like that? So it just keeps scrolling and you have to fight and move your way around. So we started doing that but Typically back then you just get bored and go, oh, this is much more interesting. Let's go and do that instead. <laughs> uh, and Dave wanted to do a shooter. So we started doing a shoot -em up uh, I think he was doing it on the Amiga and I was doing it on the 64. Um, and it was a weird one. It was um, an eyeball that rotated. And then out of each position of the eye, it would shoot a bullet. So it was like this eight firing bullets. It was very bizarre. Um, but again, it didn't last very long. But Dave got bored of that as well and he moved on. I think he started doing Menace after that or Draconia, Draconian, as it was, actually it started as Coppercorn 1, that was his, the first name that he, he started with. When did you decide to uh, start calling it DMA Designs then? And so, once Dave had gotten um, Coppercorn 1 into Draconia, um, finished, and Psygnosis were publishing it, um, it actually appeared in magazines as Draconia, and actually it appeared in the magazine first as Zynaps, because he was going to do a port first, but then realised he wouldn't get nearly as much money for it. So went to Psygnosis, got the contract to do an actual original game, uh, changed it from Coppercorn 1 into Dr Draconia, and at the time of when it was going to be uh, Zynaps, um, we were called Acme Software. Um, and there's a, a single screenshot in uh, PCW World, the little thin one I think it was, uh, with Zynaps on the front cover and uh, Acme Software that was doing it. Um, after that, it was Dave discovered that there was a company in California called Acme Software. Um, so couldn't use that. So he just pondered what to do. Uh, and he was looking through the Amiga hardware manual. Oh, DMA, there we go. So DMA design is what we ended up with. Um, and that's what Menace came out on. So Menace was published before he had an office. It was just him doing it in his, his bedroom with um, a graphics artist uh, down here somewhere uh, called Tony Smith. His art was amazing. He knew him from um, a hacker group called the Kent Team. So Dave used to be part of the Kent Team doing, I don't know, disc cropping and whatever they did, I don't know. Um, but he got this uh, demo disc of Tony's art uh, up and it was the first time he'd ever touched D-Paint. I mean, it was just astounding artwork. Yeah. Um, you had this beautiful tree drawn in deep paint and the detail on it was amazing. If you look back at Menace and Blood Money in particular, Tony's art is just incredible. So he partnered up with him and Psygnosis published Draconia almost. It, it was Draconia right up until the last minute. Um, and it, there's even some magazines with reviews of Draconia in it. Um, but then I think it was another game that is, was coming out called that. So they very quickly swapped it to Menace and it came out as Menace. Do, do you think if D-Paint wasn't around, mm. the Amiga wouldn't have become oh, such no. a, a big platform? It was, for... it was such an enabler yeah. um, for the artwork that you needed. Um, it was just incredible. I mean, so many people 
got their Amiga packs, you know, the Batman pack or the cartoon pack, whatever it was, with D-Paint in it, and just played with it. Folk that weren't artistic at all would play with it like a game, particularly because the animation, you could put stuff down and just make colours and psychedelic stuff. It was incredible. And without Electronics Arts kind oh, of yeah. committing to it and, yeah. and fully going for it. You yeah, know? I mean, I'd like to know if they made it just to do internal stuff and think, ah, we'll just release it. And then only when they saw the uptake, went, oh, we should do something with this. Because <laughs> it was phenomenal. It, it really did enable. No in-house team would have been able to make that kind of stuff themselves. So it was it enabled the whole games industry, really. And did you end up getting an Amiga yourself and others? And yeah. So once I started working for DMA, I did um, ballistics and blood money on the C64. Um, and I got um, bonuses for each. I think the first one I got like hi-fi stuff and video recorders and stuff, which we didn't have. Um, and then the second one for blood money, I went out and bought an Amiga and I got the Batman pack, Amiga 500, which was fab. Um, and then immediately started trying to dev on it, get the hardware manuals and, and, and do some dev on it. Um, Dave had done a series, or was doing a series of um, ST Amiga format um, articles on writing games. And he did a six part series on the first level of blood money. Um, and the very first uh, bit of code he did was a really simple bit of assembler that took over the Amiga system and then gave it back to the system again. So you could take it over, do whatever you wanted, and then return back to the OS. And it was the most useful bit of code he ever wrote. We all used it, it was incredible. Because you could go in, hack about, make the machine do whatever you want, and then get back to your assembler and carry on. Otherwise, you'd have to keep resetting and doing stuff. So it was it was brilliant, um, and it did mean that I think it was one of the first people that gave out effectively the source to a commercial game, um, and it, that was really important as well. I, 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 I think with the kind of development of Amiga games on on platforms, <coughs> uh, a lot of them pushed beyond the system mm. and uh, games like Lemmings and Sensible Soccer which <coughs> we're going to be talking about later and Worms later on as well uh, were really fantastic and how, how easy was it to port kind of titles mm. from the Amiga and uh, translate them onto other ones? It totally depends on the game. Um, Lemmings is a really hard game to port to uh, something that isn't a computer. Computers have nice bitmap screens and they're, they're pretty straightforward to put in. They've got lots of memory. Um, as soon as you get to consoles and you get to character maps, then Lemmings is a nightmare. Because it, it, it's basically five bitmaps wide and fitting that on these consoles that have limited memory. I mean, PC Engine only had 8K RAM. Yeah. Um, the Mega Drive had 64K. Yet this um, level was like 320K. So immediately off the bat, you, you know, it, it's really tough. So, depending on the game, you're doing a shooter, so Dave's Blood Money that I put to 64, you just kind of recreate it and make it, you know, appropriate for the machine. It's fairly straightforward, but when you get into like the Lemmings 1, that was a nightmare. That's why Lemmings 2, we, we totally changed the tech on it, and it went to character maps, so that ports to everything would be easy. Because God knows how they did the Game Boy 1, the Game Boy Lemmings, that was amazing. You know, it was yeah. torture. Well, I, I think Lemmings was one of those games that you could kind of play in front of your parents and they, they, <laughs> they, they thought it was all right until the Lemmings started dying. And uh, the, the music was interesting as well. Um, uh, did you get in any trouble for using some of those games <coughs> in Lemmings? So when we first started doing the music, um, we had this idea of using uh, 60s TV theme tunes like uh, Mission Impossible and all this kind of stuff because that would have fit really well with the kind of gameplay. Um, but at that time, in movies and, and uh, you know, the Hollywood were getting really interested in games and starting to pay attention because they were starting to make some money. And there was, you know, things like Batman coming on it. So, the, you know, there was um, movie tie-ins. So you couldn't just go and use the music. So it was decided just to do either make up music or use public domain music that was out of copyright. Um, and so there was a lot of that, except for one of them. Um, we did use How Much Is That Dog In The Window, which everybody thought was out of copyright. Turns out it wasn't. Nobody knew that, Signals didn't. We did end up getting sued for it um, and then settling for it. But we had no idea, we just assumed. 
but all the other ones were fine. Um, but it is interesting that you, you do have to remember copyright goes on a long time and it's from the death of the author um, for individuals or from the first performance of it as a company. So nowadays you're talking 95 years so you've got to be really careful. <laughs> Well, um, well, we'll talk about some of the ports of uh, <coughs> Lemmings in a minute. And I was just wondering, you're in possession of a, a Lemmings arcade uh, board. What, what happened there? And is it, is it working? So the CEO of, I believe, of Data East um, was a big fan of Lemmings. He used to love two-player Lemmings. Um, and it's a shame that's never really been brought back again. Um, but I suspect because of him, he was really desperate to get um, an arcade version of it. So they got in touch with Cygnosis, they started the process of making a board. Um, and I see guys over there actually have the board if you want to go and see it. As, as, as he whips it out, um, <laughs> you can have a, go, a look. It is a mod wire central, that one. Um, and we got a board up, we, um, we did have some arcade machines in the office. So plug it in and have a look. Um, interestingly, that's where the fast forward came from, from Lemmings 2, is on Lemmings 1 on the arcade board, they had a fast forward, and we thought it was a great idea, so we pinched that for Lemmings 2. Um, it is um, a partial port, it's, it's not fully working, um, so it, it got scrapped halfway through. Um, it does work with trackballs as well as, as joysticks. We never actually hooked a trackball up to see what it was like, which is a slight regret. The, the, uh, Arcade guys over there might hook up a trackball if they get it working. That would be quite cool to see. Um, and the board itself just sat in DMA's offices um, once we got it and that we'd had a look at it. And then when DMA were moving, when DMA shut down and then moved to Edinburgh, uh, myself and a friend of ours got to go and kind of raid the offices uh, before they moved of all the stuff they didn't care about. It was just, it was going out in a skip and the Lemmings arcade board was still there. So I took that, I, I climbed in a skip to rescue a 3DO dev kit, uh, which is now in our local museum, and a whole load of discs that I took as well. The original Lemmings demo floppy um, with just all the 100 Lemmings on it. That was in a disc box there, that would have gone in the skip as well. So we managed to reclaim a lot of stuff um, just as they were about to move to Edinburgh to become Rockstar, um, including the Lemmings board, obviously. It's it's quite interesting, uh, often there's a lot of interference on this, but um, it, it's quite interesting that you talk about like moving on to Rockstar and stuff, because, you know, you went into GTA, mm. and uh, there's always been rumours, like, was GTA ever developed on the Amiga, or was there a version for that? Um, what was the kind of decision to leave Amiga like at DMA Designs? So, for the record, GTA had nothing to do with the Amiga one. <laughs> Um, I did meet the guy, his name escapes me at the moment, um, at the Play Expo in Glasgow last week. He was, he was going around and we spoke. Um, I did tell him, we didn't make anything of it. You got money at Rockstar though, so good on you. Because they are <laughs> not nice people sometimes. Um, he was a guy that came through for an interview and he had a demo. Um, we put it on, we kind of had a little walk about and went, okay, you can code, and that was it. GT itself was an evolution all the way through its lifespan. Um, it started out as a tech demo that I wrote, trying to clone Clockwork Knight. They had nice parallax blocks you could jump on. Uh, I thought that was really cool. So I cloned that, and then somebody was saying they were trying to get a racing game past Dave. And I thought, oh, if I just put this textured wall in the background and paint roads on it, all of a sudden it's top down, instead of this side on thing. And then I put a car on it, and all of a sudden it was this kind of top down cityscape thing that GTA 1 became. Um, and from then on, the game just evolved in terms of, well, that's obviously a driving game. And then somebody would go, oh, that's really cool. We could do this and this. Yeah, that's great. And then when we got a nice driving mechanic in and they were driving about, it's like, oh, I like that car. I want, to, I want that one. I want to be able to get out and steal that car. So that went in. And then, oh, ambulances. Wouldn't it be cool if I knocked somebody down in an ambulance game and I could steal the ambulance? Oh, what about the police cars? Yeah. So all this stuff was just team driven on what would be really cool. So the whole game of GTA was just, an evolution on whatever they came up with. Um, all the explosions, the Garanga stuff as well, you know, the Harry Krishnas. We happened to be in town in Dundee and there was a row of Harry Krishnas and our musician guy, the head of the music department, Colin Anderson, and I just walked behind them, recording them. <laughs> I'm going, I've never seen them before, never seen them since. 
<laughs> and then he, he took it back. That went into the game. Then immediately someone went, you should get a bonus for running them all over in one go. <laughs> there you go. All evolution stuff. So it was never going on the Amiga. Um, dropping the Amiga after Lemmings was a pretty straightforward decision. It was clear the Amiga was on its way out um, and everything was going towards oh, console. <laughs> <laughs> Back then. Um, and it was all going towards consoles and 3D was the thing and all that kind of stuff. So PCs were going to be the way forward for that. Um, so it was just a straight decision. We'll finish Lemmings 3, which was the last game in the Cygnosis contract. Demi was contracted to do six games, I think it was. And so that was the last one. After that, onto the PC. So it was a pretty straightforward decision of it was always going to be PC. Do you think there's a, a bit more kind of like interest in the legacy now and seeing stuff like, you know, the Lemming statues in Dundee? And uh, was there kind of that much acclaim for it back then? I know it got ported onto lots of systems, but there was also lots of other titles that were out there. I think Lemmings itself has always had quite a big name and following. Um, when we were making it, you obviously don't know anything. It's just, it's a game you're working on and wouldn't it be great if people played it. Um, but once it came out and you started to get these insane reviews, you know, you get like 90 or even 100% reviews at some sometimes. Uh, and then people really got behind it. It is a game that, um, it's not just the people on the machines that play, you know, they, they pulled in parents and grandparents to play it. Mm -hmm and they all enjoyed it. It really is a kind of cross-family game. So I think it's one of these games that really helped kickstart Dundee's gaming heritage. Um, and then from that, obviously DMA managed to run for a good 10 years. Um, and that meant people came from all over Scotland and, and uh, the UK to, to work there. And then they left and formed their own companies, but stayed in Dundee and that just spawned this little gaming hub that Dundee's now known for. And because of that, the whole of Dundee's community and people that live there really got behind the games industry. So Lemmings was always the kind of, you know, thing that people focus on to go, that's kind of where it's all started. And from that then became GTA and everything else. Um, so the statues were an evolution of that. And it's great to see these kind of things appearing. So, um, you've heard enough of my rubbish questions, but um, are there any questions from you folks? And it, is there any questions online as well? If uh, you could uh, put your hands up and then uh, pick, we'll pick a question and then Mike can answer it. Is anybody? Ask me anything. Ask him anything. What's your machine of choice now? Machine of choice to play or to code? Code. Code. It would be a PC at the moment, I'm afraid. Uh, that being said, that being said, I do. I'm a big fan of the ZX Spectrum Next, yep. um, which I have several of, and I've got like three games on the go on, on it at the moment. That, that hopefully one day will be finished. Um, I also do the C Spec emulator for all the devs and folk to play stuff on. Um, that takes up huge amounts of time. Just trying to keep it up to date and. Uh, all the features in it because the Spectrum Next is a real beast. You, you think of it as just being a Spectrum with a couple of bits, it really isn't. It's a nightmare machine to write an emulator for. Um, but the actual, for retro coding, definitely the Next at the moment. I do have a Mega 65. It's really nice in terms of speed, but it doesn't have the feature set of the Next. So the Next is a, a great machine to code for. At some point, if I live to a thousand, I will go back and code for everything else because I love them all. Um, I was saying earlier to somebody that I really want to go and code a game specifically for a Pi Storm Amiga because they're ballistically fast. So what you could do on that, instead of just doing a stock one and it being fast, who cares about that? What can you do on the Pi Storm Amiga, particularly the new 32-bit ones? Because they are lightning quick, absolutely ballistic. So you should be able to do some stonking stuff on them. Um, SNES, I really want to go back and code. I did Lemmings 2 on the SNES. I loved that. Uh, PC Engine, I hated the game I was doing, Shadow of the Beast. That was a nightmare. But the machine's really nice. Um, so yeah, at some point I want to code on all of them again. But at the moment, it's the next. And then just for normal stuff and dev and tools, PCs, because I like C Sharp. So it's a really nice thing, because then you can get cross-platform, put it onto Macs and Linux and all that kind of crap. Uh, but retro machines, yeah, one day I will 
pull down everything again. I'm determined. I still have a plus four game that I'm trying to finish. It was started back in 1999. So a good 20 odd years now. Jeez, that's 24. Bloody hell. <laughs> um, and I've got like one level done. And it's got, it's really nice. You can see it on, there's a videos on YouTube. XEO3. So it's like really full, almost full screen scrolling. The 10 software sprites all going at a nice pace. Which for a plus four was unheard of. So one day I will finish that. One day. Any more? Yeah. Um, just a, oh. a quick one. I, I love Lemmings and good, you know, fantastic. All the, all the work that you've done over the years. I've played it and I still play it. I never bought a copy of it. Should I feel bad? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Get them off eBay. They're dead cheap. <laughs> so in hindsight, well, how do you, I know you would have been anti-piracy at the time, but with hindsight... Nah. How, 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 <laughs> Everybody how, copied stuff. Exactly. We have, we have copies of stuff. If, if you can afford it, you buy it. Particularly now, it's, it's a case of all the devs that do stuff now, it's such a small market. Yeah. You've got money, buy stuff because you'll help them carry on. Um, if you don't, if you simply can't afford it, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Same back then. Um, we didn't, I mean, I, I can't remember ever buying a C64 game. I never bought a Spectrum game. We had no money. Um, once I got my Amiga, I was starting to buy content and games and tools and stuff. Um, I would still get the occasional copy of stuff, but if I liked it, you, you, you buy it, if you can afford it. And that, I mean, that's kind of the rule. All these people that go and, you know, get every single game, every single this, it's pointless. You're never going to play them all. Yeah. You know, get the stuff that you really like, um, enjoy, and then at some point when you can afford it, buy it. Um, particularly the retro stuff, you know, it's... Um, or vintage stuff because retro is different, isn't it? <laughs> vintage. Um, yeah, it's, it's the people that do it now. It's, it's such a small market. Really support them if you can. Oh, we just got on here and. Oh. Then... I, I did buy Lemmings on the game day. You may stay. And I bought from the Sims Lemmings Two on the Atari ST. So <laughs> <laughs> and I completed it kind of with bronze. Um, but my question is, why isn't there a two-player mode on Lemmings 2? The problem was the PC. The PC was still the kind of market that it was all kind of going towards. And on consoles and stuff, it just wasn't really used that much. It was dropped so often. So in Lemmings 1, the two-player one only appeared on a few platforms. And it still takes a lot of effort to to make and do all the levels for and stuff. So the focus was always going to be in Lemmings 2 on the, the, the single player, fortunately. But I'm with you, I love the two player game. Um, it's just, it's such a shame it's not being done now, particularly now with internet play. It could be amazing. Never mind just two, you know, four, eight players. That'd be brilliant. Just something different, it'd, it'd be so cool. But yeah, it's, it's also, there's a slight tech limitation on consoles. So in Lemmings 2, the way it was all done, we changed the, heart, the, the technology behind it from just a big bitmap to use tile maps um, so that the consoles could do it. But they had a really limited number of tile maps. So if you had the two player one, you couldn't have that infinite number of uh, skills just to fight with. Um, on the SNES Lemmings 2 in practice mode, you only had like 20 of everything because when doing it and allocating your tiles, I'd run out of memory. Whereas the Amiga one could just keep going forever because it had infinite amounts of memory, really. So the two-player one would have reintroduced that and it just wouldn't have worked. So oh. Sorry. You need to add more memory on the actual uh, consoles. The Amiga one, I probably have the source somewhere. Oh. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I'll add that to my ever-growing list. <laughs> We've got one here. Were you involved in 3D Lemmings? No, it's yeah. horrible. Well, was <laughs> Shoot say, it in the head. Did, did anybody realise how bad the control system was? We didn't know about it until it came out. And then oh, we really? just got... a lot Because there were so many ports and stuff going on, Psygnosis would just go, this has been done. Oh, okay, there you go. Because it was... It wasn't good, no. It, it just kind of shows it doesn't work, really. Um, the only one that we really saw as it was being developed was the C64 one. Because it was a C64 dev, they set me up um, a work in progress of it. And that was nicely done, you know, using the sprites for stuff. That was, that was quite cool. But all the rest of them, we just kind of got, and this has been done. All right. But yeah, it wasn't, wasn't good. <laughs> oh, we've got 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I find it uh, quite fascinating uh, when you talk about the development of like GTA and you know how um, you know obviously a commercial endeavour but a labour of love at the same time. Um, we we'll, we'll come back to Lemmings in terms of the actual characters themselves, the Lemmings themselves. Mm -hmm. How did the idea for them come about, and was it was it something that evolved, or was it something that was an idea that just came about and was used? Or okay, yeah, well, this has obviously been in a lot of magazines. Um, so Lemmings themselves came about because of an argument. Okay, um, when Dave was doing Blood Money, um, there was a character in that a two-legged attack from Star Wars that walked about very pretty. Um, so pretty that they thought we should really do a game on that on its own, which is where the game Walker came from. Um, they hired an artist called Scott Johnson to come in and do the art for it. Um, and Scott set about drawing characters to shoot, but they were 16 by 16 pixels, which was fairly standard for that time. Um, but that meant they came up to past the Walker's knee. Now in Star Wars, they barely come past the feet, never mind the knee. So I thought that was just too big. Um, we had an argument back and forth, oh you can't make them smaller, yes you can. Yeah. So just one lunchtime I set about trying to prove them wrong and I drew that little lemming. Um, and then I'd been drawing the kind of gun that was shooting, have you seen the animation? Of the, the original animation, the inspirational anim. It's basically a one page deep paint animation, it's on the net if you go and kind of look for it. Um, lots of lemmings walking about dying in different ways. Um, and I'd drawn this gun firing and hitting a lemming, uh, or the character at that point wasn't a lemming, and it would burn down because I'd been playing Oids on the Spectrum. Uh, Brian Watson had liked me his, um, on the Spectrum, on the Atari ST. Um, over one summer when he went to summer camp in America, I got to his ST so I could learn 68,000 and play with it. But Oids was on that, and I had great fun with that because they've got tiny little characters. I think they were about four, five or six pixels high. Um, and I quite liked the size of that, but I thought you need a little bit bigger than that because they were a bit wooden. Um, and then there was another game on the C64 called Beachhead that had beautiful animation, Beachhead 2. Beautiful animation of this guy throwing grenades. So I thought someplace in the middle. So I set about doing this little guy um, and then animations of them dying in various ways. I showed that to the guys basically to prove, look, Walker can have smaller guys, I'm like brilliant. And they all fall, they fell about laughing because it was just all these guys queuing up to be shot by a gun and squished by things. And it was all very funny. Um, and L Russell Kay had just laughed and went, they're like lemmings just queuing up from that Disney thing where they all fall off the cliff. And that name just stuck. It was just, you know, the, the, the lining up to die. And so it came apparent pretty quickly that isn't it fun to kill these little sh sugars? Um, <laughs> and it was that wily Coyote thing where, you know, they're just ridiculously stupid and dying in weird and wonderful ways. Um, so Gary Timmons sat down, he did a couple of deaths, like a spinning thing and the big clown munching. And I did a 10 ton weight falling on a lemming and it, it's like, you could kill these guys in huge numbers away. Um, and so that's was kind of became the goal of the game is how can you kill them? But then obviously turn around and how could you save them from being killed? And that was Dave and Gary coming up with the skills and the, the tool set behind it. Um, but the actual evolution of that going through I mean, everything back then was a technical argument towards a game. You know, I have a new sprite routine, let's write a game. I've got a new scroll routine, let's write a game. And this was no different. It's like, you know, how many of these little guys can we get on screen? Because two or three wouldn't really be that much fun. That's where that original Lemmings demo came in. Russell K did it on the PC and got a hundred Lemmings, which was unheard of on these old machines. I mean, it was a four, four megahertz, uh, 8086, 286, he wrote it on. Um, and that's, that's, that's amazing getting 100 on there. But that was, you know, that set the standard of these things walking about and the masses of them um, to, okay, how can we write a game around this? Um, so that's kind of where they came from. We'll, we'll do one more question because we need a break before the next one. So. Yeah. Uh, the question is about the market at that time of that. Okay. Uh, so the business. Was it really important business in terms of financial there was money there was around this video games production? Or was it just like uh, for you and the others as a salary man? I mean, uh, just employee and not so uh, rich, rich market. 
So, when Dave started, um, it was just at the start of the 16-bit era. Um, up until then, it was all 8-bit, and people were making good money from it. You, you mean you, you saw them in Zap and Crash with their Ferraris and everything. Um, so there was always a desire to become a game dev and make all this money. That wasn't really the reality of it. That was a few kind of rock star devs that got these kind of things. Um, but it was still, you know, we loved making games. So, you know, if you can make a, a living out of doing this, then great. Um, so there was never a, des well, I'm not going to say there's never a desire to make loads of money. Of course there is. There was never the kind of thing going, we're all going to make billions. Yeah, was, you know, if we could, if we could survive. And, and do this for a living, that would be great. Um, so when Dave did Menace, he sold about 15,000 copies, which made him enough to buy a car and, and set up the office and stuff. But, you know, it's a living, but not going to you know, break the bank. Um, Blood Money sold about 20,000 copies, so an evolution of the same thing. Um, I, he, he hired me to do ports of games in the office while he did original stuff. Original stuff takes longer than a port. We spend about six months doing a port from one platform to the other. So um, Ballistics took six months. Blood Money port on the 64 took six months. But while I did that, uh, Psygnosis would pay him like a thousand pounds a month to do the port. And then um, that would keep the office going while he worked on original stuff. When, he did, when we finished Lemmings, um, it took about nine months or so. Um, we all enjoyed it, we kind of had an inkling it might be okay, um, but we had no idea how good it was going to be. Uh, Dave says he got, retroactively said he, he, he found out it was going to be good in that um, he took a demo disc of three levels down to Psygnosis and he left it there while him and Ian Headington went out for lunch and when he came back it was on every computer in their office. And at that point he went, oh, okay, that, that's good. So, but day one, um, Again, we never got told until years later. Um, Ian Hetherington kept phoning up going, it sold this number, it sold this number, it sold this number. Because if you think of uh, Menace and Blood Money, 15,000 and 20,000 in total through their whole life, Lemmings ended up selling 55,000 on the first day. So it was huge. You know, and it, it, it went on to make, you know, millions because it got included in the Commodore, Batman, uh, in the Commodore uh, pack. So um, you didn't get a lot for it. But the pure volume of these things, it was massive. And then it got ported to everything. So there's 21 different platforms that there were official ports for, and quite a few that are unofficial and homebrew ones and all that kind of stuff. Um, and from that 21, there's also versions of them. So compendium packs and all this kind of stuff. So it just sold and sold and sold. So again, at the start, we were just hoping to make enough to keep going and enjoying it. But once Lemming started going, you can kind of say, you could make some real money from this stuff. Well, thank you so much. You're and uh, I'm, I'm sure you're going to be around all I weekend. will be around, well, today. Today, and then today. you've got to uh, take the trip back. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. And, uh, yeah, we're going to have the John Hare talk, and we're going to do interactive questions as well. And we're going to put it back about half an hour, so um, everybody can go and refresh. And, you know, it's a bit hot here, isn't it? <laughs> so... Uh, thank you so much, though, for watching. And uh, thank you, Mike Daly. Thank you. Oh, I'll say thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mike. <laughs>